Hello. Hello. This is Kirk and Tiffany, and um, we're with Seeking the Glory of God Ministries, and we have a word for you today. Yes, the Lord um, wants to talk about the idol of relationships. <laughs> so an idol is anything that is between you and Jesus that you've exalted in your heart above the Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord, then he's Lord. <laughs> and he's the one that we would obey. So this is what yeah. he's addressing. And it may sound a little bit harsh as we go through it, but the point is he says that there's many people who are being held back from their destiny and what he's calling them to do because of this. So right. as I speak this, I am believing that the Holy Spirit is setting those of you free who need to hear this. Um, and that from this point on, this idol is shattered in your lives in the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And you will fulfill that calling that he's placed in your heart. He's given you a vision for. Okay, so the Lord says that there are people, churches, groups, etc. that are exalting marriage and family relationships above Jesus. And the reason for this is they believe that they must live in unity and peace with their spouse or their family, but they don't actually have a good idea of what unity means to God. So we're going to go for that right now. Unity is not conformity. Some read like Psalm 133 in the scriptures and they think they get a wrong idea about what God's saying. So let's read that first. Psalm 133, New King James. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Well, that sounds really good. It is. <clears throat> it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Unity is great, and it brings tremendous blessing and power. But even unity in darkness has power, <laughs> as is demonstrated with the Tower of Babel, right? They thought that they would get together and build something, and God had to go and mess it up because they were united, but not by the Spirit of God. Yeah. And that's the key that God wants us to understand about unity, is the Spirit of God. So Ephesians 4 uh says, this is the beginning of Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I therefore, this, the I is Paul, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Hmm. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay, so because there is one Holy Spirit, and that's the spirit we've been given as believers, that is the spirit that unites us. Unity any other way is not of God. So when people use conformity instead of unity of the spirit, it ends up looking like denominationalism, striving, manipulation, law. For example, uh, one denomination may say they're all in unity because they all believe a certain doctrine. And another congregation, denomination, may say they're all in unity because they believe the opposite doctrine. <laughs> However, does anybody really believe that all these denominations are the will of God? <laughs> does the Holy Spirit have more than one opinion on its subject? Would he tell one church, for example, that healing is not for today? And then he'll tell another denomination healing is for today because that's what you see Jesus doing. That's what he paid for. Well, of course, he's not going to tell them two different things. That's ludicrous. The Holy Spirit is not divided. And as people agree with him, they'll have true unity of the Spirit, because they'll be agreeing with the Spirit. You know, another example of mm -hmm. um, a kind of unity that you don't want, I was just 
just came to me is Ananias and Sapphira. Right. Ungodly unity. <laughs> they, <laughs> they dropped dead. <laughs> they, they, uh, but they had unity. Mm -hmm. But God doesn't didn't respect that unity that they had because right. it was not putting him first. Mm -hmm. right. It was not um, under Jesus. Right. So. Yeah, and Paul, in one of his letters, he um, says to two women, I want these two women to agree with the Lord, in other words, because they were having a contention between them. So, okay, so now bring this unity thought into family relationships. If you are a believer, one who actually believes God and agrees with what he says and is led by the Spirit of the Lord, and your spouse is not a believer, doesn't do any of that, can there be true unity of the Spirit between you two? No. There really can't, because can you truly be united with someone who doesn't follow the Holy Spirit? Not just a spouse, but anyone. Really. You, you really no. can't. If you try to be in unity with an unbeliever, for example, an unbelieving spouse, you're going to end up giving up truth, and you'll end up following that person rather than following God. So, does God desire unity in your marriage? Absolutely. Of course he does. He desires mm -hmm. all men to be saved, yep. all men to follow Jesus, to be led by the Spirit. But you cannot use your spouse as an excuse of why you do not follow God. Mm -hmm. Do you think if you've heard God on an issue and you don't do it because your spouse isn't in agreement with you, that that excuse is going to hold water in front of God? It won't. You say to him, I know you told me to do this, Lord, but you know, my spouse, they said, you know, no, I don't agree with that. I don't want you doing that. And so then I didn't do it. Well, who's Lord? Yeah. <laughs> you really think you can say to him that, you know, I know you told me to lay hands on the sick and they recover. I know you told me to cast out demons. I know you told me to preach the gospel. I know you told me to make disciples of all nations. But my spouse didn't want me to. And so it caused friction in our marriage. So I didn't do it because I wanted to live in unity with them. <laughs> hmm. That excuse won't work. Who is Lord? Is your spouse Lord? Do they matter more than God? Does their opinion matter more than God's? Is your unity with them more important than your unity with God? And I understand this will ruffle some feathers because this is pretty heavily preached in a lot of churches mm -hmm. that you need to submit to your spouse and that's submitting to God. Well, you do submit to one another out of love, but that looks a lot different than what people are preaching. Uh, one time I was sitting in a church reading my Bible and inside I, I could hear the message inside. It, it was on marriage and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, they're exalting marriage above Jesus Christ. It was oh. very plain, and it came out of the blue. And it was a church that frequently had messages on marriage uh, week after week after week every year. <laughs> and the reason that they did that is because they saw a problem. There was a problem of divorce in the church. It was running rampant. Oh, sure. And so they were trying to correct it. But rather than preaching Jesus, they were preaching some form of unity conformity some form of mm, let's let's just um ag let's just try to agree together you know your spouse says this and you say that so let's kind of meet in the middle and mm -hmm. that's not really how the lord works you follow the holy spirit if there's something going on in your marriage you ask him you ask holy spirit and he'll give you words to say He's, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. He might tell you, yeah, do what they're saying. Give up what you want. I mean, you're dead to self yeah, anyway yeah. as you follow Jesus, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, and this is, I, I just like to say, if you read 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is kind of addressing this issue of being married to an unbeliever or being married to a believer and how that works a little bit for that particular church, but it kind of speaks to the whole idea. Um, he's saying, look, if, you, if, you've, if you're not married, don't marry an unbeliever. Don't become unequally yoked because you can't have true unity, okay? True. Yep. So to begin with, if you're not married, don't marry an unbeliever. <laughs> That's what he was telling mm -hmm. them because otherwise you're going to have problems. Um, so obviously you always follow the voice of the Lord. This isn't a law, okay? But he's telling them that they'll run into issues if they, if they do that. And then secondly, he says, now, if you are married, 
and then you become a believer, but your spouse is not, you're not to leave them. (laughs) You're to stay with them. You don't divorce them just because they don't agree. Um, You you love them, but you follow the Lord. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So then um, I was reading in Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 11, and this is what God said. This is how he views exalting any relationship above Jesus. And I'm going to read out of the NIV for this. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your fathers have known, gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far from one end of the land to the other, do not yield to him or listen to him. Show him no pity. Do not spare him or shield him. You must certainly put him to death. Your hand must be the first in putting him to death because he tried to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. Well, this goes just with what Jesus taught in the New Testament. He says in Luke 14, 26 to 27, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is the cost of discipleship. Jesus Mm -hmm. is to be Lord, and no relationship may come before that. And of course, now in the New Covenant, he's not telling anyone to stone their family for not following (laughs) Jesus, okay? But he's saying it's serious. You cannot love them more than God. You can't even love yourself more than God. Remember, you die yeah. to self. If you truly love God, you'll not exalt another relationship above him. And being concerned about pleasing your husband or wife is actually considered the affairs of this world, according to 1 Corinthians seven thirty three and 34. But instead, we need to live in undivided devotion to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's in 1 Corinthians seven thirty five. 35. Um, So all of this is focused a lot on marriage, but it's true for the entire family. The Lord's talking about all relationships here. So do you love your family so much that you're willing to follow them and agree with them so there's no dissension among you, so that you'll even give up what God wants you to do? Jesus said you can't serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. If Jesus is Lord, then he's Hmm. Lord. (laughs) And we always look at Jesus, right? So Jesus is perfect theology. Um, Look at him as a child. He stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents thought he was being disobedient. Why have you disobeyed us, they said to him. (laughs) He was following the Spirit. He was Mm -hmm. listening to the Lord and doing what Father wanted him to do. He was following God above his parents. I must be about my father's business. I must be about my father's business. And isn't that what you'd want your children to do? I mean, wouldn't you love it if you found out they disobeyed you because they heard the voice of the Lord and did what he said? I mean, wow, that's what Mm -hmm. we desire is our children to follow Jesus. Or remember when Jesus was ministering when he was an adult at someone's house and his mother and his brothers and sisters come outside the house and they're like, "Um, tell him to come out because we think he's lost his mind. (laughs) Well, he didn't. (laughs) Um, He he didn't come out and he didn't lose his mind. He was following Mm -hmm. Father, doing what he saw his Father doing. And really, this is a common thing among believers that they have to deal with. When we were talking about this, the Lord was bringing to mind many testimonies that people have of having to go against their family or against their spouse in order to follow the Lord. It's very, probably too numerous to count. Yeah. Um, you take almost any Muslim who becomes a Christian, and this happens to them. Um, they're frequently beaten, thrown out of the house. The women are raped. They are stoned or killed in another way. There's a cost, um, but they choose to follow Jesus rather than their family. And sometimes in the West, we think it's bad if our family just thinks we're weird or they just ridicule us because of how we follow the Lord. Then Father is saying today, my people, this should not be. A life fully committed to Jesus will be a life of love, 
You don't have to worry about loving your family. You'll love them if you're following the Lord. They'll see Jesus in you. You'll speak him and live him because he says, as he is, so are we in this world. So follow him. Surrender to him. Decide today to serve him alone. The Lord says the devil is holding some of you back from your destiny because of this lie of exalting human relationships above your relationship with Jesus. And he doesn't want this anymore. The truth sets you free. And this is the truth. Jesus is Lord or he isn't. So choose today whom you will serve. Choose life. I, I, I can't imagine that we really think that we can love even an unbelieving spouse better without Jesus or a, the way that the spouse wants it to be. And then we put Jesus in second place. Uh, that's that just doesn't make sense anyway mm -hmm. um, we 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 follow Jesus he's our Lord and Savior he he leads us in paths of righteousness mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth mm -hmm. what are, what are we going to get into if we don't follow him even in one area of our life it's, it's it just doesn't make any sense and uh, you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> so all right I, that's all I have. I think I, you know, I, I, I like the idea of, um, I don't like it. it. It's the idea that idolatry is putting something between you and Jesus. So even don't it doesn't matter what it is or, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. That's, that's I guess that's the point. Yeah. If you have something between you and Jesus, you have an idol. It could be the Bible. It, it could be just anything. Mm -hmm. But if it's between you and Jesus, it's an idol. Mm -hmm. And in this case, Tiffany is correct in saying um, relationships can be that. So um, I think that's it. All right. Follow Jesus. He loves you. He loves you so much. He wants, to, wants you to serve him exclusively. That's right. Hello. Hello. This is uh, Kirk and Tiffany, and we want to tell you about Seeking the Glory of God Ministries and, more importantly, Destiny Road LLC. DestinyRoadStore.com exists to help those who are at risk or have been rescued from human trafficking. While spreading the gospel to the nations, supporting orphanages, and helping our partner Jimmy in Haiti to spread the gospel there. All of the money that you spend at Destiny Road goes to further the Kingdom of Heaven. If you would rather, you may donate to Seeking the Glory of God Ministries and the information is in the description box below this video. God bless you and thank you. God bless you.